President Garasi, I present Freeman Horabowski. Trustees Warren Prochi and Ralph Green will assist in placing the hood on the shoulders of Freeman Horabowski. Mm -hmm. For the past 26 years, 26 years, Freeman Hrabowski has served as president of UMBC, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. His research and publications focus on science and math education with special emphasis on minority participation and performance. In the year 2012, he was named President Obama, by President Obama to chair the President's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans. A child leader in the civil rights movement, Dr. Hrabowski was prominently featured in Spike Lee's 1997 documentary, Four Little Girls, on the racially motivated bombing in 1963 of Birmingham's 16th Street Baptist Church. In 1988, with philanthropist Robert Meyerhoff, Dr. Hrabowski co-founded the Meyerhoff Scholars Program. The program is open to all high-achieving students committed to pursuing advanced degrees and research careers in science and engineering. The program, recognized as a national model, is further committed to advancing underrepresented minorities in science and engineering. Time Magazine named Dr. Hrabowski one of America's 10 best college presidents in 2009 and one of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2012. In 2011, he received both the Theodore Hesburgh Award for Leadership Excellence and also the Carnegie Foundation Academic Leadership Award. These awards being recognized by many as the nation's highest awards in higher education. In 2012, Dr. Hrabowski received the Heinz Award for his contributions to improving the human condition and was among the initial inductees into the U.S. News and World Report Leadership Hall of Fame. Indeed, Dr. Hrabowski has received honors beyond number and certainly too numerous to mention here. It is, however, important to observe that Dr. Hrabowski has been named one of, quote, America's best leaders by U.S. News and World Report, which significantly ranked his university, UMBC, the nation's number one up-and-coming university for six straight years, beginning in 2009. For the past three years, U.S. News and World Report has ranked UMBC in the top 10 on a list of the nation's, quote, most innovative national university. But Dr. Hrabowski's university has earned national recognition not only for its academic prowess. No, no indeed. Only two months ago, UMBC also earned unprecedented national acclaim for its athletic excellence. <laughs> As, see, some of you know where I'm going, okay? As many of you who follow collegiate basketball may know, something quite miraculous occurred this year during March Madness. For the first time ever, in fact, for the first and only time in the 78-year history of NCAA Division I basketball, a number 16-seeded team defeated a number one-seeded team. The retrievers of UMBC stunned the nation and the number one ranked University of Virginia Cavaliers 74-54. And so the retrievers of UMBC have enabled Dr. Hrabowski to add an athletic feather to his already impressive cap.
Wagner College is both proud and delighted this day to honor you, Dr. Freeman Hrabowski, for your outstanding contributions to American higher education and indeed to American society. You have opened doors for so many, doors that would have remained closed without you. You honor us by your presence here today. With the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Wagner College and the laws of the State of New York, I hereby confer upon you, Freeman Rabowski, the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters Honoris Causa, and thereby declare that your name forever be inscribed in the role of Wagner College's most esteemed alumni. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Some years ago, our beloved and now late Maya Angelou looked into the face of America and said, lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it, this dream, into the palms of your hands. Mold it into the image of your most private self. Sculpt it into the shape of your most public need. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face and say simply, very simply with hope, good morning. Give poetry a round of applause. Poetry. Give poetry a round of applause. If you knew how nerdy my campus is, you would really understand how stunning a victory over UVA is. But I am proud because two of those basketball players had 4.0s. Give them a hand for the 4.0s. <laughs> Graduates, I took the pleasure of and had the pleasure of asking to talk to a couple of your classmates to get a sense of who you are. And I want both Glenn and Ellen to stand because they were very helpful to me. They are my cabinet today. Glenn and Ellen, give them a round of applause wherever they are. And I also met another young man that I'm going to call the essence from what his president says of, of perseverance. Where's Jojo? Get Jojo to stand up also. Jojo. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. The word we use is grit for all of you. This is what your classmates said. They said that most important what you are proud of is the fact that you have great professors, faculty and staff. Give your faculty a round of applause. that there is this intimate relationship between faculty and staff and students here, that you have first class discussions on the sticky issues of the day at a time when most people are uncomfortable with those. Wagner has encouraged its students to talk about the challenges we face in our society. Give your college a round of applause for doing that. It's very impressive. And then they said that you are very proud that you are a very diverse group in so many ways, race and ethnicity from all over the world with different interests, different perspectives, and that you appreciate each other. Give yourselves a hand for inclusiveness, for inclusiveness. I will start with stories. The human story is one of both tragedy and hope. We are one week from the time of Mother's Day. So celebrate with me for a moment, mothers in the room. Give mothers and grandmothers and all of them a round of My first story involves my own mother who grew up in a, a little rural town in Alabama. And as a child, she had a choice of either working in a hot cotton field in Wetumpka, Alabama, or, or going and working in a wealthy home. And she decided she wanted to see how rich people live, rich white people. And the woman was very kind to her because the house had something that she had never seen, a library in the house. In fact, there was not even a public library for children of color in the late 20s and 30s. And the woman said, Maggie, when you finish your work, you can go in and read. And mother began to take an interest in these books. And the woman would say, take the book home, read it, come back, let's talk about it. 
I want you to write me a few paragraphs about what you think. And all of a sudden, mother became a very different person because she began to develop her language skills and she was fascinated by the ideas in the books and she began to see a distinct, distinction between herself and her girlfriends. And here was the problem. Her girlfriends were really angry when they would say, Maggie, come outside and play. And, and my mother would say, no, I want to keep reading this book. And they would say, why would you want to read that book? This is not school time. And then she began to watch them when they were reading for my future teachers in the room. And she said, when they began to read, they began to frown. And they'd push the book aside and say, this isn't interesting. Well, nothing is interesting when you don't do it well. And here's the point for all of you, because you're in human service areas and healthcare and business and whatever, but at the foundation is this notion that you can read and think well. She said the more she read, the better a reader she became. And the more proficient a reader she became, the more she enjoyed the experience. And the more she enjoyed the experience, the more reading she did. And so all of a sudden, she realized exactly what she wanted to do for the rest of her life, and that was to become a teacher. And she became a teacher. Give the teachers in the hand. Give the teachers a round of applause. And she became a teacher of literature, and she would quote Zora Neale Hurston in her book, Their Eyes Were Watching God. The book begins, ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. For some, they come in with the tide. For others, they sail forever on the horizon, never out of sight, never landing, until the watcher turns his head away in resignation, his dreams mocked to death by time. That is the life of men, and she would say, and women. Give Zora Neale Hurston a round of applause for the idea of dreams becoming to And today you are celebrating your dreams, students, and the dreams of your parents and your grandparents, and all of them have done so much to get you here today. And as I tell you these stories, I want you first to know your own story. Know your story and don't let anyone else ever define who you are. Round of applause for the idea. Nobody else defines who you are. It's very important. And you, some of you, your students, you saw my story yesterday sitting in the back of the church, not wanting to be there, doing my math and eating my M&Ms, the good kind with the peanuts, working really hard. And all of a sudden, the man says, if the children participate in this peaceful protest, all of America will understand that even our children know the difference between right and wrong. And all I could think about was that the only books we could use in our schools were hand-me-down books. After white schools had finished, they put brown paper bags and then give them to us. And my parents were not allowed to buy my books because then I'd be different from other kids. And so all of these children felt like second-class citizens. And here was this guy who sang, perhaps this can be different. And I said, who is that guy? And of course, his name was Dr. Martin Luther King. And we were inspired. And after my parents had told me I couldn't go, and I said, you are hypocrites. And then they said, go to your room. You never told your parents at that time that they're hypocrites. You know that, right? But they did let me go. And we did march, and you heard all about that. But you need to know something. I was not a courageous kid. The only thing I'd ever attacked in my life was a math problem. I am a math nerd. When the teacher would give us 10 problems, I'd say, give us 10 more, teacher. And the whole class would go, shut up, Freeman, because I love math so much. But here is the point. All of that led to the March on Washington and the civil rights legislation. You don't know this, but believe it or not, in the 60s, only 10% of Americans had gone to college. People didn't expect their kids to go to college. This is a 50-year experiment, and you represent the result. Because of those times, you look out and you see people from all over the world, of all races and ethnicities, and America has changed. And yet, we face challenges. And my students say, but there are all these divisions. And I say, but go back to the 60s, or the 1960s, or the 1860s. And there have been divisions before, and it's taken people like you to say to the world, we can be better than this. And I challenge you to use this fine liberal arts education to analyze what you can do, to decide who you want to be, and to ask yourself the question, who am I and who do I want to be in 50 years? You know, it was Samuel Beckett, an Irish novelist who often wrote on Francais, who said, here's something. He was studying the dancing of beasts. He said, here's something I could study all my life and never understand. And all of a sudden, he realized the idea was this. Oh, my God, the more I see and understand, the more I realize there's so much more to know. And the constant 
thinking of an educator is this. You've just begun to learn. Never stop learning. The more you learn, the more you realize there's so much more to know. I want you to know your story. I want you to keep thinking about what you can do to keep learning more and more. I want you to find ways to find the common ground, as you've been doing at Wagner, when you have the difficult situations, to learn how to listen. When you saw Hamilton and when you see Hamilton, you hear Mr. Hamilton asking Mr. Burr the question, what do I do to succeed? And Mr. Burr told Mr. Hamilton, smile more, talk less. I sat where you sat some years ago, and I just asked my girlfriend to be my, to be my wife. We've been married 48 years. Give her a round of applause for that. 48 years. And the one lesson I learned that I want you to know, smile more, talk less. Give me a round of applause for smile more, talk less. At the end of my mama's life, as I close, she had come to live with us, and she had developed dementia. This brilliant woman of literature had, had, didn't even know who I was, and I was an only child. And one day, we're sitting out on the porch, and she looks at me as if she knows kind of who I am, familiar. She said, I know the end is near. And when somebody's at the end of their lives, you get a sense of what's important. And I said, what's important to you? And she said, what's important? She said, relationships. This is my gift to you, class, relationships. She said, my relationship with my God. She said, hold on to your faith. You'll be okay. I was trying not to cry. And then she said, my relationship with my husband, he's a wonderful man. She'd forgotten daddy had died. And then she shocked me. She looked me right in my face. And she said, you know, I have a son. Now, she, I told you I'm an only child. I'm thinking, she said, oh my God, she had a kid when she was a teenager. She never told me about it. <laughs> I'm thinking, as my students would say, TMI, too much information. If I haven't had a brother this point, don't you drop this bomb on me and die? I'm really, I am not happy. I am not happy, all right? I'm looking mean. And all of a sudden, she said, he's a college president. Thank God she was talking about me. But then she gave me the greatest gift of all. She said, but you know, I now understand that teachers touch eternity through their students. Whatever I had to give, I gave it to my children, and I will always live through them. Class of 2018, watch your thoughts. They become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Dreams and values. Congratulations to the class of 2018. Congratulations to the class of 2018. Before we move, thank you, Freeman. My goodness. We're in a, under a tent for a reason. It's like a revival movement. Thank you. I'm so honored that Lee and, and Freeman were able to be here with you today. Makes this day very special.